good morning, and thank you for choosing to worship with us today. We are Ian and Nora and Claire and Willa, currently in Asia, and super excited to be with you here today. Skyland Baptist exists to help others see Jesus, be in community, and care for others, and we're super excited to join with you in those things today. I uh, want to ask you if you are uh, a guest to fill out the card and uh, the, it's there provided for you and put it in the offering box. We won't be taking up an offering in the service today, but there is an offering box uh, outside as you enter and exit. You should see that there. We also wanted to just say quickly, thank you guys and we love you and we miss you and we're super grateful for the way that you support Skyland and the way that you support us uh, through Skyland. It allows us to be where we're at as we continue to serve and see the kingdom of God spread and grow. So again, we love you guys and thank you. And thank you for joining us th this morning. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never. Your heart is kind for all 
bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name, I worship Your Good morning, Scotland Baptist Church. We're uh, so glad to get to worship together this morning, uh, virtually this morning. Uh, unfortunately, if you're watching this, it's because you weren't able to come this morning to, to gather with us, and that's, uh, that's perfectly fine. We're, we're uh, uh, encouraged by, uh, by you watching and being a part of our services this way until you do feel comfortable to be with us in the hopeful near future. We, we uh, I uh, want to share a couple of things we did. One is that this isn't a live deal. Like, uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks we'll be able to film these live and, and you'll be with us in the moment when we're uh, sharing uh, in the service together. Uh, but that'll be probably a couple of weeks away. Uh, you know, I was thinking about uh, being in front of you again this morning and I have not had a chance to get to the haircut place. So uh, still kind of... Um, having the quarantine uh, comb over thing, hair massive everywhere kind of deal. So uh, just pray that I find a barber. And if you can help me with that, feel free to message in to my uh, email. Anyways, um, I, uh, I love you and just know that I'm praying for you. And I want us to open together uh, this morning in Genesis chapter 17. If you'll, if you'll open your Bible with us and we'll begin to study God's Word. That, that whole hair thing reminded me of one of our ladies in our church from a while back. If you remember, uh, I'll, I'll tell her name in a second, but I was, I was on stage and bro Brother Jimmy brought me aside after the service. He said, hey, uh, so I heard one of the folks uh, just sharing a little bit about how you, you might need to get a haircut. And I was like, okay, fine, sure, who, <laughs> who was it? And he said, well, it was somebody in the choir. I was like, really? And he goes, I think it might have been Miss Opal. Uh, anyway, if you know Miss Opal, she's the sweetest lady in the world. So I went immediately and got a haircut because she's, uh, if she thought I needed one, I definitely did. But, but um, <clears throat> I, I miss uh, Miss Opal, wonderful lady who went on to be with the Lord uh, in our church. But um, this morning, chapter uh, 17, we're going to be in verse 1 here. So uh, we'll start in verse 1. It says this uh, in chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, <clears throat> I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. 
I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. Just want to stop there for a second. We're going to read a little bit further uh, in just a second, but notice this. So right at the beginning of our passage, you know, last week we talked about how God sees and God listens. Um, that was the case last week with the story of Hagar, and and she was kind of on the run, and God God ha- had an encounter with her, and 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 she spoke of God as the one who is El Roy, the one who sees everything, the one who though also listens, and she named her son Ishmael because. She, uh, she said, the Lord has listened to my affliction. That, that was, um, was kind of some of the, the context from last week. Uh, but this week, uh, we see that this, uh, this kind of section right here in chapter 17 is really going to be largely about Abraham speaking to God. God speaks to a- Abram um, about who he is. He, he tells him, in fact, who he is. He, he gives him a new name for who he is and and, and he also is going to lay out this covenant that he is going to make with Abram. It's a weighty moment. Can you imagine God speaking to Abram? And God saying, listen, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. Abram in this moment is going to recognize the greatness of God on a whole new level. Before, God was Elohim, the God who created. Um, uh, Then we saw God was Yahweh Elohim. He was Yahweh. He was God of the covenants. Um, But now we see that he is not only El Roy, the one who sees, but he's also El Shaddai, the one who is in control. The God who creates, the God who's in covenant, and the God who is in control. Who is speaking to, to Abram? Man, it is God Almighty. And man, listen, the speaker is the one who's going to demand a listen. And if any speaker does, it is El Shaddai. It is God. And, and obviously, Adam, I'm sorry, Abram has some great thoughts about who God is. Man, if, if there's uh, one thing that I would say is so important in, in thinking about Abraham recognizing God's greatness, it's this. A.W. Tozer said, what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And rightly so. If you have great thoughts of God, then you're going to live a life that, set, that, that, is, that is going to be doing great things for God. I, I, I come across different folks that sort of, you know, you can tell their thoughts of God are unique. And um, maybe we, at times we have wrong thoughts of God. Even I sometimes um, uh, often have, have wrong thoughts of God. I'll think of God as more the, the heavenly grandfather that's not really concerned about the sin that I'm doing. And so I'll be, I'll think, oh, he's okay with that. I'm, I'm just going to do what I do my thing and he'll do, he'll do his thing and he'll still love me anyways. He's going to wrap his arms around me and kind of do that heavenly grandfather deal. But that, that's a wrong view of God. Another view of God that some people have is, is, the, is the policing kind of God, you know, the God that is uh, basically a killjoy. Are you happy? Oh, no, you need to stop doing that. You know, that kind of view of God where, where the idea is that, uh, that God is, is uh, one who's constantly looking down and seeing who's out there and, and uh, seeing who is, is having uh, some fun or, or, or ha- having some kind of joy. And he wants to make sure, no, we, we don't have any fun. We want to obey all the rules. And, and that's not God. Um, that's a, far from, that's a far cry from who God is. Uh, uh, I tell you, God, uh, he, he wants you to uh, delight in the greatest delight, which is himself. And he, he, is, uh, he is the place of, of pleasure and happiness and joy. And uh, it is far, a far cry from, from that picture. But in this passage, up to this point, uh, kind of a right thought about God is that God is the creator. He was the creator who spoke everything into being. He's, the, he's also not just the creator, but he's also the judge of all of his creation. He's the one who spoke it into being, and he's the one who knows how that creation runs best. 
And so we see God's judgment poured out on sinful people in the, in the Noahic flood and, and that covenant God made with Noah to say, hey, look, I'm gonna put a rainbow in the sky as a reminder that I'm not gonna pour out my judgment in this way anymore. But we also see that God is merciful. God is looking out for those who are the afflicted, those who are the down and out as he moves toward Hagar in the, in the scene that we just saw a week ago, as he encourages and, and celebrates with Abram through the, the priest Melchizedek after uh, Abram goes and gets Lot and rescues him. You see, God is merciful but here in this passage, he's going to lay out all these, all these things about the covenant. And, and he's going to say, I will, I will, I will, over and over again, this part uh, of the passage uh, that we see uh, this, this morning. He's the covenant maker. That's, that's who God is. He is the almighty God. And a God who makes covenants, uh, who is sovereign, is able to keep all of his covenants. And that's the way, that w- that's what we see in chapter 17. Uh, the phrase that comes right after God reveals who he is is the words, walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. You see, one thing that's interesting about the story of Abram is it's kind of going to give us a glimpse into our own lives. Hopefully your life, um, uh, hopefully you've come to a place where, where God has called you because that's exactly what God did in chapter 12. God called out to Abram. And then in chapter 15, it was Abram who by faith was, a, his faith by faith was counted righteous <laughs> by God. It, he was justified in that moment. And that justification lends itself to a life lived for, for the Lord. And we see that in this passage. Not only is, is, is Abram justified before God, but God is making a covenant saying, hey, walk before me and be blameless. The command is walk before me. It's a picture of sanctification. So Abram has been called, he's been justified, and he's growing in sanctification and growing in holiness to the Lord. Uh, that's the picture, hopefully, of all of our lives. If you have trusted in Jesus, that is the picture of your life. Look with me at what it says about Abram here in verse 5. He says, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Isn't that interesting? God changed the name of Abram. God went from Abram, father of many, to Abraham, father of a multitude. Now, we can kind of think about this in, in Abram's day. Let's move ourselves into the biblical passage for just a second. Abram, just think about this. Uh, for 86 years, Abram went around saying, hey, I'm Abram. Uh, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, father of many. Yeah. And they're like, oh, well, who are your kids? And he's like, oh, well, I don't, I don't ha- have any of them. <laughs> and for 86 years, that went on until Abram by steps kind of sidesteps God's plan and and, uh, having a child with Hagar that we talked about last week. And now he has one child. And so so he has this child and God is just now uh, basically said, okay, Abram, Abram, uh, I'm gonna call you Abraham. You're gonna be a father of a multitude. (laughs) Um, Can you imagine Abram, Abram, now Abraham going to his friends and saying, hey, yeah, you know how I said I was father of many? Well, now I'm I just want you to know I'm actually going to be a father of a multitude. <laughs> uh, I guess they, they probably thought, man, that, that one kid, that's kind of went to his head a little bit. You know, I mean, what is he, what's he thinking here? But um, the thought here is that Abram is indeed uh, told by God, you're going to be a father of a multitude. What does that mean? I think this is probably the most important question we're going to ask this morning. The most important question for us to ask is this. Was Abraham the father of a multitude of nations? Was he the father of a multitude? If you look at the story, you read the rest of the story, you'll see that really he only has two children, that being Ishmael and Isaac. None of those boys are are kings. uh, uh, So in a sense, physically and politically, he really isn't a father of a multitude of nations in that sense. However, He is the father of a multitude in another way. Because many nations would one day enjoy the blessing of sonship despite not being physically related. How did that happen? 
You see, God, from the very beginning, he had a plan and he had planned for Jesus to be a descendant of Abraham. And everyone who believes in Jesus and in what Jesus does when he comes to this earth, lives a sinless life, dies in the place of sinners, then rises from the grave, everyone who trusts in him would become an heir of Abraham's promise, a son or a daughter of God. One in Christ. Listen to what the passage in Galatians says. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. You see, we are one in Christ Jesus. We, uh, we are one in Christ Jesus. We're Abraham's offspring. We are heirs according to this promise by faith in Jesus and what he accomplished for us. It was Abram that had faith and it was accredited to him as righteousness. And so it is with you and me when we place our faith in Jesus, the descendant of Abram, that we also become a part of this family that begins here with Abram. If the, the thought is that we are one in Christ Jesus, but not only do we see that in, in the New Testament, we also know this, that the way we are one in Christ Jesus is through faith alone by grace alone. We know that because of what Paul said to the church at Rome in chapter four, verse 16, he said, that is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. You see, we are one in Christ Jesus by faith alone in his grace alone. This passage has a lot to say about grace alone. It really does. If you, let's read the rest here, uh, in, starting in verse um, verse 9, we see a glimpse into the sign of the covenant. But before I do that, though, let's think about this. If we're heirs of Abraham's promise, let's, here's what this passage is telling us. We are not heirs by working for God. We are heirs by God working for us in Christ. You see, Abraham believed God would do the impossible. Abraham believed that God would give him a, a son even though it seemed virtually impossible for him, especially a son by Sarai. But Abraham believed that God is able to do what he promises, even if it seems impossible to him. And we know right now that his promise came to fruition. We know that one day there will be a multitude that are uh, of, the, of the heritage of Abraham who are around the throne from every people, every tribe, every nation, many multitudes of people will come before the throne of God. We know this because of Re Revelation 7 says, after this, uh, John said, after this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. See, the question I asked is, was Abraham the father of a multitude of nations? And it's that question, no, if you were just talking about Abra Isaac and Ishmael, but the answer is a resounding yes if we see how spiritually he was a father of a people, of all kinds of peoples by means of salvation, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The sign that's at work here in, in verse uh, nine, it, look what it says, I'm gonna read this, this briefly. It says, God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is 
eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your own offspring or of your offspring. Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. All of that simply was a picture of how God was going to allow a sign uh, of the covenant to be circumcision. Now, if you don't know what that word means and you're a kid watching this, ask your parents. They'll tell you all about it. But, but the idea here is this is a physical sign that was kind of a, a picture of a spiritual reality. A, a physical in, in that um, it was the cutting of the flesh, but it was spiritual in that it was symbolic of being a part of God's family. You know, similar, there's some similarities between baptism and, and uh, circumcision. Both are signs and neither one of them have any salvic benefit. Um, but circumcision is not the same as, as baptism in the New Testament. They're not exactly perfectly the same. However, they're a good way to kind of understand each other. Uh, in, in, a lot, in, in this passage, I'm going to talk about three ways in which they kind of do parallel a little bit. For, for example, number one, the, the idea of putting off the old. In Colossians, it tells us that in Christ also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In other words, kind of New Testament picture here, uh, we're kind of seeing, hey, look, in, in Jesus, you were circumcised. But when you trust in Jesus, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of that old picture kind of brought into this new covenant picture uh, in, in what Paul was saying there. Uh, it's, it's putting off the old. There's also a picture of committing to the Lord. Um, uh, in Deuteronomy, it talks about uh, this commitment to the Lord. In chapter 10, verse 16, there's a, uh, there's a conversation about how the God's people are be, to be committed to him. And circumcision is kind of used to, to talk about that commitment. And the last thing, we see this in verse 14. If you want to look really quickly in verse 14, it says, Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now that is, so not only do we see kind of the parallel here in putting off the old and commitment to the Lord, but we also see that there's something significant about circumcision that represents being separate from the world. Uh, it's, it's a means of creating a new community. Uh, so uh, the bottom line here, when we think about circumcision is that this seal, um, it was kind of a, a picture of the seal of our salvation in the New Testament. It's in, in the Old Testament, it was an external thing, but now we know in the New Testament, it's not about an external right, but it's about the presence of God within us. When Christ saved us by his spirit, he performed a spiritual surgery upon each one of us in which he took out a heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. Verses 15 through 21 uh, we see kind of the last part of this story unfold. And I'm going to read just a little bit of this to you. It says, And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah. S Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abram, Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. This is probably the most important part, a request denied here. Abraham asked, Hey, what, just, just let Ishmael be it. Can't, won't Ishmael work? And God said, no, verse 19, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, which means laughter, by the way, because Abram was laughing at the thought. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He'll be a father of 12 princes, and I will make him into a great nation." But I will establish my covenant 
with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. God graciously offers up even a timetable here of when he's going to come through on this promise that he has made to give Abram and Sarai, and now Abraham and Sarah, a child of their own. The question comes to mind, why is it that Ishmael wouldn't work? Why did God deny the request of Abram to say, or Abraham to, to say, hey, look, why don't you just consider Ishmael? I'll tell you why I think that he denied the request. I think that he denied it because Ishmael represented basically man's best efforts <laughs> and man's attempt to help God out. And the truth of the matter is that our God doesn't need any help. He is God Almighty. You see, there's 13 years between chapter 16 and chapter 17. 13 years passed from, from the time of, of this son Ishmael being born to the, this moment when uh, God would, would allow this cir- circumcision to be the sign of the covenant. And the, the thought here is that the reason why it took so long and God waited this long is, is he's really waiting on, on, on Abram and he's now Abraham and he's saying, hey, listen, man, you tried to sidestep the, the, this whole thing and, and, and I wanna, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it on my timetable. And I'm going to do it in a way that only I get the glory for it. You see, God's delaying here was for God's glory in this moment. And oftentimes that's the case. God delays for his glory. Romans 4 tells us this in verse 18. It says, In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. You see, the thought here is this. The reason why God says no is God's saying, hey, look, I'm gonna delay this so that only I get the glory. I'm gonna make sure that you're old enough to where it will be said of you. There is no way that this guy's gonna have a child after 100 years old. There's no way Sarah can have, she can bear a child at 90 years old. Only God could do that. And that's exactly the way God wanted it to be. He wanted this, this covenant to be based on his grace alone. This is going to be a gracious picture. You see, God's promises are based on two things. His power, he's God Almighty, he's in control of everything, he is in power, and his grace. His grace and, and his willingness to forbear with, with his people and, and his willingness to, to be gracious to them and, and to do things that only God could do. And the beauty of that picture of his promise is, is that those, that promise is available to us. Yes, it's based on his power and and his grace, but the beauty of that whole thing is that it's available to you and me. No one's perfect. Uh, One one pastor uh, was was one time coming to the conclusion of his sermon like I am right now, and he said, he said, let me ask you guys, have any of you, have any of you been perfect? Is anybody here perfect? And he saw one hand go up in the back. So he he said, sir, uh, have you lived a perfect life? The fellow with the raised hand stood up and he said, I'm not, I haven't, but my wife's first husband was. (laughs) All that to say, um, that's a joke to say, listen, the reality is none are righteous, no, not one. That's the Bible says. That's that's what Paul says in in the book of Romans. Uh, he, He says, listen, there is not one that's righteous, none are righteous, no one can help God. No, no one can add to what God has done in salvation. No one comes close to that. All that we have to offer up here is filthy rags before God and our sinfulness. And by God's grace, he offers up everything we need in his son, Jesus in his sinlessness and his willingness to die in the place of sinners. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're in desperate need of God's grace. It's us who receive God's grace through repenting of sin and turning to Jesus. Listen, friend, I'm telling you right now in this moment that that Jesus died so that you could have and receive the favor of God and so that you could not try to earn your way to God, but you could receive his grace. 
You could repent of your sin and place your faith solely in what he did when he came and died and rose from the grave. Listen, that's how you can become a child of God. God is mighty to save. He's the one that can do the impossible. He's the covenant keeper. He's the one that says, I will, I will, I can keep it because I can do things that seem impossible to you and I can do it. The vilest of sinners I can save. What seems impossible is not impossible with the Lord. So I would simply say, maybe there's someone who's listening and you're thinking, man, it'd be impossible for God to forgive me of all my sin. My word to you this morning would be simply this, repent, believe, and be saved. Be born again, not of your own doing, but of the Holy Spirit this morning. If you never trusted in Jesus, my encouragement would be come to know him. And if, you, if, if that's where you are and, and the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart and your life, I wanna encourage you uh, to go, go into the, the section that's about getting connected to our church on our website, go there. Or, or if you're on Facebook, just message us in that, uh, to our, uh, our Facebook page there. Let us know, we wanna know. Because man, God has done this to create a new community. Just like that sign of circumcision did uh, back then in the Old Testament, baptism is that new sign in the, in the new covenant. And, and so the idea would be, man, if you've made that decision to follow Jesus, don't let it just be you that knows about it. Share that with us. Uh, and the goal in the end would be for you to be baptized, for you to identify as a follower of Jesus and to live for him so that your life will have uh, a great counting for uh, the Lord in the days to come.